hello everybody. Welcome to Talk It Out. I'm Li Jingjing. I'm very honored today to be joined by Mr. Vijay Prashad. He is a historian, a political commentator. He's the executive director of Tricontinental Institute for Social Research, and he's also the writer for many books, including the very recent Washington Bullets. So, Mr. Vijay Prashad, welcome. Thanks a lot. It's great to be with you. So, I will start by asking. What do you make of this new AUKUS? The AUKUS is the new security deal between Australia, UK, and the US. So that's the acronym of these three countries. Just explaining some details for our viewers. So basically, this AUKUS pact will the US and the UK will help Australia to build and deploy the nuclear powered submarines, and that definitely will increase the military presence of those Western countries in the Pacific region. So. There's a lot of chaotic. It's it's on the headlines every day now. So I'm wondering, what do you make of this? Well, you know, the first thing to know is the United States already has important military pacts in the Pacific area、um, with Australia. The United States already is in the Quad, the Quadrilateral Security Arrangement with India, Japan, Australia, and the United States itself. Um, there is also, of course, the Indo-Pacific strategy, which is integrated into the navies of a number of countries in the region. Again, including India, Singapore、uh, plays a role here, South Korea, and so on. The United Kingdom wasn't in any of these arrangements, and Mr. Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, has been very eager to have a deeper bilateral security arrangement with the United States. You know. Ever since Britain left Europe with the Brexit, Boris Johnson has sought to have an equation with the United States. So the British sent along a carrier group, the Queen Elizabeth,、uh, which is now in the South China Sea. And the issue with the Queen Elizabeth is that much of the actual staff, the soldiers on the ship, are actually from the United States. They're not British. So they're already very much in what they call interoperability. They are working together. So the British have sought some sort of, you know, direct military、um, relationship with the United States, particularly vis-a-vis -vis China. I think that what's happened here is a little confusing, Jing Jing. If we're honest with each other,、um, to some extent, this is an arms deal masquerading as a security arrangement. Um, the Australians had a big purchase of submarines from France. They were ready to have the French start building the submarines and so on. Well,、mm -hmm. the thing is, these are not nuclear power submarines, but they're still submarines at a very modern kind. The Americans came in and said, "Look, we'll provide you with nuclear powered submarines." In order to get around the nuclear non-proliferation treaty, they said it's not a nuclear weapon submarine; it's just powered by a nuclear reactor. And if we have a military deal, that's an easier way to get out of the arrangement with the French and then buy the U.S. thing. The British happily went along with this AUKUS because they wanted some formal security alignment anyway. You see. So in a way, I feel like actually the United States didn't need AUKUS、uh, to so-called put pressure on China. They already have enough military and security instruments. It seems to me this was much more an arms deal, pretending to be a military deal, which is why the French reacted so strongly, and they、mm -hmm. withdrew、uh, ambassadors from Australia and really spoke quite harshly to the United States. These. Western allies, they are allies, and they they try to create a new alliance to to seems like to deal with、uh, China. But then you see there are conflicts between them,、uh, like、uh, France and Canada, both kind of、uh, sour over this new strategic alliance between the three countries. So, what what's your thought on this? Well, you see, there's another issue involved here.、Uh, for the last sixty odd years,、uh, in different ways, the United States, Canada, New Zealand,、um, Britain, and Australia have been part of an intelligence sharing network called the Five Eyes. You know, five countries all having eyes on the world. Now, these are the old colonial countries. You know, and settler colonial countries. These are British colonial 
um, outposts, Australia, New Zealand, and so on. So in a sense, New Zealand took a very good position. New Zealand said, look, we don't want nuclear powered submarines entering our ports. And they said, therefore, we will not enter this alliance. I think to some extent, the Canadians felt left out. But, but very importantly, Justin Trudeau is entering a very difficult election right now where he's facing opposition from the conservatives. He's sort of miscalculated in calling for the election. So he cannot afford to be too hawkish one way or the other. You see, too much anti-China, too for China, etc., etc. He would have preferred not to have this. And it, at some level, changing this looked a little embarrassing for the Canadians. How is it that Australia, the United States, United Kingdom have formed a new group New Zealand directly said we don't want to because of the nuclear issue, but Canada was left out. So he looks a little bit like the boy who was not invited to the birthday party. Yes, there's a lot of battle between the various um, allies. And you've got to understand that mainly they are fighting over arms deals. That's the key mm -hmm. issue here. Their strategic orientation vis-a-vis -vis China is pretty clear. They all seem to want to roll back China's scientific and technological developments. That's the real issue here. They all mm -hmm. seem to want to do that. The issue on the table is who is going to sell arms to whom? And the United States has been very aggressive using military arrangements to sell arms. To some extent, even the military arrangement called the Quad with Japan, Australia and India is mm -hmm. an arms deal and a basing deal. You see. When Japan came into the Quad through Shinzo Abe's leadership, when Shinzo Abe was the prime minister, it traps the Japanese government into no longer raising the question of military bases in Japan, in Okinawa and so on. You might remember that in 2009, there was an election in Japan where the party that won the, the election, won a big mandate, won the mandate partly to roll back US bases in Japan. Now, with this new one, two, three security ar arrangements, particularly the Quad, the question of bases is now permanently baked into the cake of Japanese political culture. N nobody is going to be able to run again and say, let's get rid of the US bases because they say, look, we're part of Quad. So you have to really understand these alignments, these Quads and AUKUSes and all of that. Mm -hmm. It's partly about US power projection, it's partly about arms deals. Don't underestimate mm. the power of arms deals. And also I find it interesting, um, like the articles, how the media, some media are reporting this, even though uh, the uh, for, during the AUKUS pact, they didn't mention the name of a particular country. Uh, but like, for example, these two articles on CNBC, it says US, Australia and the UK unveil new security partnership as China expands its military and influence. And the other says uh, China's aggression led to the formation of a new trilateral security pact, says defense expert. So they're trying to say because of China's aggression, China is being very aggressive in, in, in those regions. So we need to have this new deal. Is that really the case? Well, the first thing that I think is important is that I would hope that the non-aligned movement, the NAM, the G77 plus China and other bodies that have that wield a little influence in the United Nations would ask for clarity from the United Nations political uh, department, the DPA, the very high department of the um, Gen Secretary General's office. These important blocks need to ask for clarity about the so-called freedom of navigation exercises. Like, is it a violation of international law to have a British warship, American warships, German ships, Japanese ships basically come close to the Chinese um, international waters line to provoke a confrontation in the South China Sea? Um, I think it's a well worth uh, asking for some clarity on this because the United States has been using the theory of freedom of navigation to allow its military to come closer and closer to Chinese waters. In fact, in times sometimes go into Chinese waters. That's one thing that I think some clarity is needed. The second important clarity is 
what do people mean, including people in, in our profession, journalists, what do we mean when we sit down and write copy and talk about aggressive behavior? What do we mean by that? You see, uh, aggressive behavior towards what? Now, Hong Kong, for instance, is a part of China. Um, in 1961, the Indian government sent the military into the Portuguese colony of Goa, Daman and Diu and forcibly brought those back into Indian territorial control. That was in 1961. Um, this question was never raised again about Goa and whether India was aggressive towards Goa. In 1948, the Indian army went and took over Hyderabad in the center of India. It was the independent kingdom. Indian army went into Kashmir and for instance, you know, to establish the territory, it's a perfectly legitimate uh, way for states to behave under international law. Now, I'm not saying whether I agree with it or not. I'm just saying under international law, it's a perfectly legitimate thing for states to do. So the question has to be asked, let there be clarity. What do you mean by aggressive against whom is um, the Chinese aggressive in, in, in these press reports? Some specificity is important. Are they talking about Hong Kong? But Hong Kong, after all, in 1997 was so-called returned to China by the British government, which held it as a colony. Um, are they talking about what are they talking about? Some islands and so on. Let's have some clarity about what's being spoken of. If we're talking about a disputed island or an island chain, you know, very small parts of land on the earth, do you really want to risk a major military confrontation to clarify the property or the ownership or the territorial claims on a certain island? Strikes me as quite remarkable, Jingjing, at a time when islands are vanishing in the South Pacific because of rising seawaters and climate change. You're worried about the integrity of islands? Deal with climate change so that island chains don't vanish in the South China Sea. Deal with the fact that Emmanuel, Emmanuel Macron recently went to so-called French Polynesia. He went to Tahiti and he was asked to apologize for over 30 years of nuclear testing done so far away from territorial France. And he didn't apologize. You know, let's talk about those aggressions also, you know, on the table. So I think clarity about this freedom of navigation, it should be asked at the UN because the press in the West is using this phrase to explain something which I don't think they even know what they're talking about. And the second thing is this idea of territorial integrity. Let's have a discussion. What do you mean by threaten or, you know, be aggressive towards towards whom? Um, I think that that kind of clarity is important and journalists need to be asked those questions. You can't just say, well, you know, we got to have a security thing in the West because China is being aggressive. In what way? You know, in what mm. way? Um, the United States just pulled out of a 20 year war in Afghanistan. Uh, I didn't see Chinese soldiers there and there are no Chinese soldiers in Afghanistan now. So who is being aggressive and what do we mean by aggression? Who is the aggressor? Yes. So that's my uh, next question I want to ask you because um, what do you make of this uh, U.S. tactics of the information war? Um, for example, um, the U.S. government committed so many atrocities across the world. Um, so many Muslims were murdered or displaced because of U.S. wars and bombs. Um, they committed a genocide towards indigenous people and there are now still systematic uh, discrimination towards people of color in the United States, yet they are still considered as the beacon of democracy, the beacon of human rights uh, defender, and China is uh, being seen, being deemed as, as many across the world, especially in the West, as, as this big bully, big aggressor. So they must have a really powerful propaganda skill to be like me when you are the perpetrator being seen as uh, deemed, be described as the uh, protector, defender of human rights. So how is that possible? It's actually very simple and it comes down a little bit. And I, I don't like talking about race and racism in such a, you know, straightforward way. I'm generally quite, uh, you know, controlled in the way I talk about these things. But in this case, uh, let's be quite frank. There is an under, uh, 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 there's an underlying assumption. There's an assumption in the media in the West, but of course broader than that. There's an assumption 
that when the West acts, it acts to uphold high values. So for instance, when the West goes into wars, it's about human rights, it's about you know, promoting democracy and so on. The West doesn't go into wars to commit war crimes. And, and we know this. We know that this sensibility exists, Jing Jing, because after the NATO bombing of Libya, uh, many of us sent letters to um, NATO asking NATO for clarification about the nature of the bombing. Well, NATO doesn't have to respond to a journalist from India. I understand that. But the United Nations also asked NATO, and so did Human Rights Watch. And NATO's lead lawyer, Peter Olson, wrote them back on the record saying, essentially, he said the following. He said that, look, I'm glad you're doing an investigation of, of you know, inadequacies in war. Let's not call them war crimes, whatever. But he wanted to be clear. NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, never commits war crimes. Never. That's it. So we don't need to investigate us. We never commit war crimes. That's an interesting attitude. How do you know that? I mean, particularly given that at the same time as this was occurring, people were going through the uh, State Department cables and the Pentagon materials released by Chelsea Manning through the WikiLeaks organization. And, and there was direct evidence of war crimes in Afghanistan, in Iraq. OK, we didn't have direct war crimes from the WikiLeaks cables on Libya. But we had NATO war crimes in Afghanistan. We knew that the Swedish government decided to enter the NATO campaign so they could test weapon systems in Afghanistan. All of that through Chelsea Manning's, you know, uh, revelations, uh, you know, of the State Department and, and mm -hmm. Pentagon materials. But they still have this huge feeling that the West only acts, you know, the West enters wars to bring good, never for some bad purpose. And the reverse of that is the adversaries of the West are always savages. You see, that's the colonial mindset that the West goes into the colony to civilize people. When the colonial rises up and fights back, they are being savages. This goes back to the way Western reporters wrote about, you know, Khartoum, the Battle of Khartoum in 1884. They wrote about the Boxer Rebellion in this way. Every time the Chinese resisted the opium wars and so on, the Chinese were treated as savages in the media. Like, how dare you fight? And if you fight, you fight brutally. When the Indians rose up in 1857, in the great Indian uprising of 1857 against British rule, every British newspaper said these are savages. They conduct atrocities. You know, after that war ended, Indians who were caught, who were caught by the British were strapped to cannons and the cannons were fired as a warning to others not to um, not to fight. I mean, it's a brutal, brutal repression of people. And yet that doesn't change the impression of the West as aggressive. The West is always doing things for human rights and, and the savages are always wrong. Now, until we're able to convince our international fraternity of journalists not to adopt these kind of colonial and racist ideas, to ask basic questions, you know, Look, the United States killed, I don't know, a million people in Iraq in an illegal war. You don't call that genocide. But meanwhile, you're adopting, you know, a U.S. State Department designation to talk about Xinjiang. You know, how, how do you get that? We have evidence of over a million Iraqis killed because of the U.S. war. You never use the word genocide there. And frankly, I don't think the word genocide is useful for that. Genocide has a particular meaning. You know, the attempt to eradicate a people. What evidence is there in the, you know, Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region of anything like genocide? And yet they use the terminology because they believe in the end that the State Department doesn't lie to them. And I think that's astounding after all these experiences of the lies that led people into the Iraq war, the lies over the Libya war, the ridiculous lies through the 20 years of this occupation of Afghanistan, you'd expect sensible journalists to say, hey, listen, le let me let me just look and see what's going on here. No, you don't have that. Instead, what you have is you have people just repeating, you know, like um, like ventriloquist dummies, you know, the 
when you have a little ventriloquist dummy and you're saying, hello, my name is, here's the State Department. Here's Mike Pompeo, who was the head of the CIA, which conducted the torture of Muslims in Guantanamo and black sites all over the world. Mike Pompeo is saying, I'm the defender of Muslims in China and the media just puppets Mike Pompeo. I mean, they don't ask the question, who is speaking to what end and is there any is there any legitimacy to what he is saying? And also, is there any truth to what he's saying? And how do I establish that? There's no investigation. Lastly, some years ago, a journalist who covered North Korea for many years said, you know, the thing about covering North Korea, the DP um, RK, the thing about covering that country is that you can say anything about it and you and the paper will print it. You can say last year, 50,000 dogs were killed in North Korea and it will be the front page of the New York Times. You don't have to have two sources. You don't have to have external valid, valid, you know, val validification. You don't have to have any of this. Whatever you say about that country, they'll print it. And I'm afraid the situation is like that now with China, that anything a journalist wants to say about China will get printed. And, and that's that's concerning, I think, for journalists. It's concerning for the truth. Wow, I want to give you a, some applause because well said. I totally agree with you. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I, like China and India share the similar um, history being the colonies of the UK and the Western allies committed so many horrendous atrocities uh, towards the people in China and in, in India. So, and how could they still get away with this? And for example, about the Xinjiang issue, because I personally went to Xinjiang many times as a tourist, as a journalist, and I do have interactions with the locals, either Muslims or not, Uyghurs and other people, other ethnic groups. And uh, so I, at, for example, I on Twitter, on Facebook or YouTube, I tell what I see and I show what the people told me there. And it doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter, like there's no genocide because their population is, is growing. And they say there's no freedom for religious rights. I say, well, there here is a mosque and they even allow me to go in. And people don't care about what I said. They won't cover what I said on Western media. And they immediately add a label uh, as a Uyghur genocide denier to people like me and so many expats living in China who actually went to Xinjiang and say, hey, uh, what do we see here uh, is different from what you report. So they try to, what I see is they try to discredit, uh, diminish what we say by adding some labels like human rights deniers, state-linked um, influencer or state-affiliated media. So I, I, think, I think this is one of their tactics by discredit anyone speaking anything positive for China. Some people are not actually standing up for China. They are just saying, I think you, what you say about China is, is wrong. They're, and those people are not necessarily agreeing what China's government is doing. So uh, do you see uh, some, some techniques or some patterns uh, when uh, the, U, the, the government like the US or the UK or, or these Western countries, that when they are pushing some uh, propaganda for war, uh, what kind of techniques uh, will they use? Yes, so um, at our institute, Tricontinental, we developed the theory of hybrid war. Um, the idea is that, you know, all wars don't happen on the battlefield. I mean, this is an old idea, but we're trying to systematize it. And as part of modern warfare, you have economic war and financial war. You know, you can do trade wars. You can have sanctions against a country. You can cut off access to dollars, which actually is terrible for most countries because dollars is how we reconcile payments. You can shut off the SWIFT system to send money back and forth. You can prevent countries from having access to the IMF, which, you know, the IMF is a very dubious organization. But IMF a stamp of approval brings commercial credit into the country and so on. So there are different ways in which warfare takes place. One of them is information war. Now, look, for the last 50 odd years, um, maybe more actually, since maybe um, the early part of the 20th century, the Western media was able to put itself forward as extraordinarily sophisticated. Um, BBC was the leader of this, you know, BBC World Service was the gold standard. 
of creating the image of having a credible, um, you know, a masterful uh, ability to tell stories from all over the world, you know, have reporters all over. And then, of course, there's the great British voice, you know, it's 1800 GMT, welcome to the BBC. And, you know, you, you, you just mm. sit in your chair and think now comes the truth, you know. And so what happened is over the course of the last several, you know, as I said, 100 years, more than that, maybe a little bit, um, media as it grew in our countries, in India, in, in Zambia, in Argentina and so on, would rely upon uh, the BBC World Service, would rely upon Reuters, the wire service, the Associated Press, the wire service, Agence France Press, the French wire service, rely on them to provide coverage of the world. And these Western wire services or the BBC shaped thinking about the world until today with the addition of CNN in the 1980s and 90s with CNN, they actually defined for hundreds of millions of people around the world, billions of people, they define how to see the world and sometimes changing how to see themselves. That's what's the worst is that you're waiting to see how CNN reports the story in your country and sometimes your reporters follow the lead there. It's extraordinary. Now, in the last few decades, we've seen independent um, you know, national news agencies develop, some of them private, some of them government, but a lot of you know, opening up in the media, some of it thanks to digital media and so on. So in India, you've got, you know, hundreds of private media channels and, and all kinds of most of the new developments in media in these countries have been domestic. So domestically, there have been, you know, new ways of reporting stories, different voices coming on and so on. It's quite interesting. It, it, for a while, it did democratize the media. International reporting was still reliant on Reuters, Agence France Press, on, um, you know, uh, on CNN, on BBC, on the Associated Press and so on. They still essentially copied what they wrote. Now, it's interesting, the Russians, after the fall of the Soviet Union, tried to create an international media presence. And they went first, and that was RT, Russia Today. The Gulf countries, particularly Qatar, funded Al Jazeera. They tried to go out there and make an impact. The Chinese uh, media came later, and that was CGTN. Um, that was, you know, various other outlets coming from China. So what happened very interestingly, in order to discredit these media houses just on YouTube, um, there's now a practice by YouTube, a Western company. If there's a CGTN story, it says this is a state assisted or state supported or a state media. It's interesting. They say Russian media, it's a state supported media and so on. But they don't say that to a BBC story. If there's a BBC story on YouTube, it doesn't say British government media. It's a way to cast doubt in people's minds. So they say, OK, look, Jing Ying Li, she's on a, she's a government media person, you know, whereas Adrian Zenj, for instance, who is with the Jamestown Institute, isn't with the CIA or the State Department. or I don't know who funds him. I'm, I don't even know. But it doesn't question his legitimacy. But your legitimacy mm -hmm. will be questioned. This is important. Now, even within countries, when this different media started to report about things inside, press freedoms began to be curtailed. I mean, you know, you see this in India and in different countries where the government is using income tax department, saying that, you know, independent media is, is conducting fraud, tax fraud and so on, trying to put pressure on journalists. We see an increase in the killing of journalists, but this is for domestic reporting. International reporting, it's so easy to discredit. You just say, oh, yeah, you know, they are state media, whereas, you know, BBC, which is state media because it is funded by the taxpayers and so on, is completely credible. And so I think until we're able to break through this barrier of credibility and demonstrate that, look, you know, you're a, you're a reporter. OK, maybe when you go to Xinjiang, you tell it as you see it. Right now, you're not saying you have God's point of view or you're telling every story there. There are stories you could be missing. But what you're saying is also legitimate. Why can't we listen to you when they say, let's listen to all the stories and so on? Why do they say, no, we won't listen to your story? I find that very, very disturbing. 
you can't have adequate diplomacy in the world if you don't take other people's viewpoints seriously. You just can't have real diplomacy. And what you saw, what you saw in Anchorage, Alaska, when Antony Blinken, U.S. Secretary of State, went there and met the Chinese foreign minister and high officials of the Chinese government, Wang Yi and others, you know, when they were there, Antony Blinken started to lecture them. That lecturing is actually a good, a short, little, little demonstration of how the Western media operates. You don't need to listen to, um, you know, Foreign Minister Wang and what he has to say. Uh, you can silence him because he is state supported media, whereas Anthony Blinken can say anything he wants. You know, he can talk about international values and the rules based system. What rules based system, Anthony? You know, you, you just are in the middle of a war in Afghanistan and in Iraq, which was illegal. What rules based system? But you can lecture because you're not listening to other people. You can't do diplomacy if you don't have real information and, and respect for other people's opinions. No matter how ridiculous the stories they make about China, I think people tend to believe. And even, I mean, even for Chinese, if you criticize your government, if you're like a refugee, or if you, at least as long as you don't agree with the government, you are a credible resource, source, you are a credible resource, and uh, they will put you on the front page, big headlines. But if you are saying anything positive about China, then you are a mouthpiece, you, you are a paid shield. I post something on, on social media platform because I truly believe those, and as a Chinese person, as a young, one of the young generations, Chinese people, I truly believe that and, and tell people what I see, but they will add all these labels on me and they don't care about, they don't, they're trying to make like Chinese, if you're saying positive things about China, you are brainwashed. Oh, you're pathetic Chinese people. You're just brainwashed, you would have never seen the world. If you have traveled to other countries and actually saw what a democracy countries like America and the UK looks like, and you're still saying the positive things about your Chinese government, um, then you're a paid mouthpiece, <laughs> CCP shield. So I find this uh, tactics very uh, funny. Okay, so my next question is, because we also see this attacks um, from, from the, uh, the US and UK on China's foreign policies. COVID broke out in Wuhan. China export the COVID and infected the world. When China helps other countries with the, its vaccines, its vaccine diplomacy, they don't really want to help you. <laughs> they want to, well, it's to, it's to bargain and also their vaccines don't work. And uh, also it's all this uh, criticism about Belt and Road and also uh, China's help with uh, Africa and Latin America as a debt trap. So how do you see this uh, tax on China's foreign policies? I mean, it's one in the same sort of piece of the information war. Uh, and, and, it, and it's a curious thing, you know, if it's true that the Chinese vaccine um, does not work, um, then why not release the um, patents on the mRNA vaccine from Moderna and Pfizer? Release the vaccine. If, you, if you're really confident that your vaccine is better and you want to help save the world, release the patent and let the Chinese uh, pharmaceutical companies make the mRNA vaccine and then distribute it to the world. Right? That's a logical thing. You can't say on the one hand, the Chinese vaccine don't work, doesn't work as well, and yet we are not going to release our vaccine from the patent wall. Wow, that's a bizarre... But again, journalists don't ask questions like that. They, they partition mm -hmm. these things. They say, well, you know, we think that the patents should be lifted, but we understand research and development and the bio... And on the other side, they'll say, well, you know... Well, look, what's interesting is that the three countries that have been most aggressively uh, distributing their vaccines around the world, Cuba, China and Russia, these three countries had their vaccines produced in the public sector, in the state sector. These were not produced in the main by private companies. There have been private companies participating in the producing of the vaccine, but they're not private vaccines. They are public sector vaccines. Whereas the private sector pharmaceutical companies are unwilling uh, to release the patent, unwilling to distribute into the COVAX facility. You know, just last week, the head of the WHO in Brazzaville, Congo, for the WHO Africa, said that, you know, Africa is not going to go beyond, I think, about 10% vaccination um, because the COVAX has been undersupplied, you know, the COVAX being the vaccine alliance. Um, so, I mean, the, 
interesting feature for us is that as reporters, you know, I, I don't see myself as, you know, I'm on this side or that side of a fence. You know, I mean, when I go into a story, I want to understand the story. I'm very, I really am very interested in stories. You know, what's the story? I followed some of the things you were seeing in Xinjiang. You know, you're a curious person. I, I saw that. I said, she's a curious person. She's interested in people. She wants to talk to people. That's what journalism is about. You know, we are not warriors in, in some sort of existential battle in the world. We are interested in stories. We want to tell the truth. Interestingly, the labeling of people like, you know, yourself and so on as whatever labels they throw is part of the information war. And I think the response to them is, I don't know what you're talking about, because frankly, take the case of, of the vaccines again. I'm trying to understand why it is that the public sector companies are giving uh, vaccines around the world. The private sector is holding on to the pattern. What does this say about the nature of the economic systems in the world? You know, should um, health and medicine be part of the uh, private sector? Is it a good idea? Uh, to have privatized health care, you know, is that helping people's health? Look at the case in, in countries like India, where India out of pocket health care expenses is the leading cause of personal bankruptcy. Is that a good thing? Let's just think about it. You know, let's not come into this and say, I believe in the following. I want to ask you, tell me, and I'd like to see what other people think, because the issue is that these questions aren't raised. You know, we're, we're now living in a world of a lot of loud noises where people are loudly saying genocide or, you know, uh, mm. you know, Chinese flu or whatever they, you know, these, there's such loud noises, Jing Jing, that what you want to do is you want to say, can we dial the volume down? Can we mm. please talk as humans to humans? Can we mm. discuss what's worrying us? You know, if you're worried about something that's happening in Western China, why are you worrying about that so much? Like why, why are you so seized about the situation in Western China? You, you have not in the last 50 years said a thing about the Palestinians. Um, you have mm. not said a thing about the people of Western Sahara and you know, these other parts of the world where there are hideous occupations taking place. You know? You've not said anything about the terrible way in which the people of Eastern Congo have faced a 50 year war. You know, do people even know that the city of Goma has been in a war for decades, you know? Do people mm. know that? Um, mm. So why are you so upset by what's happening in Western China? You don't know anything about it. Only yesterday you learned the word Uyghur. You know, you, you have no idea. You've never read a book about the Uyghurs, but you're so convinced about something. You're like a warrior on the internet, you know, trying to uh, save the Uyghurs. You know, you've mm. never talked to a Uyghur or met a Uyghur in your life. So the question I want to ask people is, why are you so angry? You know, what, what is making you so angry? Calm down, listen to other people's voices, listen to the stories that make us human. I'm interested in your story, you know? What's the story you. of your life? What made you a journalist, you know? Wh why did you want to report difficult stories? Why, why didn't you just say, look, I'm gonna pack it in, okay? I'm just gonna report one festival after the other in China because they're so colorful and delightful. I don't wanna deal with all this stuff on the internet, people abusing me, you know, making me feel bad about myself and so on. Who needs that, right? Yeah. I'm curious, why are you like that? Well, that's because journalists should be curious people. We should be motivated by curiosity, not by ideology. And part of the reason that I decided to make stories about Xinjiang, I go to Xinjiang several times, because uh, when I read the news on Western media, when they depict Xinjiang and Uyghurs, it's so far from the truth. Not, not just the uh, like awful allegations. It's, it, but those reports, by the color of the pictures they, they chose, by the way that the, the women wear in the pictures, it's not, the, you know, they have no idea what Xinjiang is really like, what a Uyghur is really like, what their cultures are like. Uh, if you go there, like Uyghurs, not all Muslims, they are like, they have traditional, very colorful clothes and they love dancing. And uh, so I hear this claim, why you always post w videos of Uyghurs dancing? It's like the only thing they do is dancing. I mean, if you know anything about Uyghurs, it's, it, dancing is really important in their culture. It's like Latinos love to dance. It's part of their culture. So those people who care,
care the most, uh, care the Uyghurs the most on Western media, know nothing about Uyghurs. So I want to show the everyday life, everyday life of Uyghurs and the people in Xinjiang in general. And also, it's, 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 I think it's funny when some people, uh, those anti-China, uh, those who attack China all the time on, on, on YouTube or on Western media, they always say, well, I don't hate China. I, 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 don't, hate, I don't hate Chinese people. I just hate their government. On the other hand, they don't understand Chinese people's culture. And it's the same when they say uh, they care about Muslims in the Middle East. They care about Africans in Africa. They are trapped in the death trap by China. Uh, sounds like People in Africa don't can't make a decision by themselves. They uh, they can't make a deal, uh, judge which is a good deal, which is bad deal. So I find it's very hypocritical in the names of I care about you, I care about human rights. On uh, the other hand, they are doing uh, this uh, horrendous uh, propaganda, consent, uh, making a consent for war. Okay, so because uh, this weekend you will join this webinar uh, talking about. The, the importance of multipolar uh, world. So, uh, what kind of issues are you going to bring uh, to this webinar? Well, you know, there's 193 countries in the United Nations. People forget that. They, they think there's only, you know, a handful of countries, you know, the, maybe the five permanent members of the Security Council, or maybe just the United States. Sometimes the United States behaves as if it's the only country with a mind, and the rest of us are just bodies on the planet. So 193 countries, 193 countries have signed the UN Charter of 1945. The United Nations Charter is our guiding document. You know, just recently, 18 countries created the Group of Friends in defense of the UN Charter. Um, it was an initiative of Venezuela, Cuba, and so on, but including China, Russia, number of countries have joined uh, the Group of Friends. Um, the, on the table from these countries is not a question of we want to see the diminishment of you know the United States, the defeat of nobody's talking about defeat of the this kind of warlike language is not useful and it's not even on the table. What the countries are asking for and what I 100% believe and have written about for the last 20 years is we need to move away from a unipolar world system where one country tries to define everything. And we need to move to regionalism, to multipolarity. We need to have a much more multilateral world order where other countries are able to put their opinions forward, where people respect the opinions of other people. So this weekend, it's going to be an exploration on the no Cold War platform, on the tricontinental platform. It's going to be an exploration what does it mean to think about multipolarity in our period? And are people being too um, you know, uh, hasty to say that this is the end of US power? Personally, I believe that US power should not be misunderstood. Uh, the United States has a major military capacity, very powerful control of financial institutions and information institutions, very powerful control. So I think it's juvenile to say, well, the United States is over, we've entered a multipolar world. I don't think we've entered it. I think we're trying to understand what the world looks like. And I think this webinar is an exploration um, in that. Are we going to try to think about how to advance the cause of multipolarity and what that will look like? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Prashad. Thank you. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much for spending this time with us and sharing your insights. I really hope that we will have you more on this show.